Hey, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, th th uh, th this week we are very happy to have a Tarong Kana from uh, HBS uh, Harvard to talk about India. Um, Tarong, you have a one hour and uh, during your presentation, um, uh, questions will come up you know, during the same time that we all try to encourage the um, uh, discussion, etc. So be prepared for that. So, um, how do I see the questions? Do um, oh, uh, so uh, you know, we the, the panelists will ask you. Okay, great, great. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, uh, inviting me to the organizers um, in Asia and in uh, Chicago. Uh, this is a joint paper, um, uh, and I'm glad it's a one-hour format. I think that works for Zoom. Uh, this is a joint paper with uh, a bunch of different people. There are a couple of uh, uh, colleagues who are at INSEAD in Singapore, uh, one at HBS and a couple at uh, Harvard Med School and School of Public Health. Um, so it's a paper that came together, obviously motivated by the current crisis. Um, uh, I'm sort of interested in the uh, institutional foundations of uh, economic activity, which is a broad umbrella. And uh, to me, it looked, uh, in addition to being policy relevant, uh, particularly for very poor people who are experiencing food insecurity, uh, uh, not just in India, but in actually most countries around the world, even rich countries, uh, I think it's uh, an interesting exercise beyond the policy relevance because it speaks to some broad issues that are of general interest. For instance, the efficacy of the state uh, in implementing policies, particularly under duress and in, in uh, quick action, speaks to issues of federalism, you know, center and uh, state responsibility, or center and province responsibility, if you will, on getting things done, uh, and a bunch of other issues that I think you recognize as we go through, uh, go through the setting of the analysis. It's a very simple, straightforward paper. It has a lot of empirical limitations that will become clear, but uh, but the exercise itself is pretty conceptually straightforward. Um, let me see if I can move to this. Uh, so, as I said, you know, um, this was not limited to India. I just put up four photographs here. The one on the top left is in uh, Minneapolis, uh, not far from you guys in, in, in the Midwest. Uh, food banks, uh, there are lines, you know, uh, four, five, seven mile long lines, even in the United States for people uh, waiting for food. On the top right is from uh, Harare and Zimbabwe. The bottom right is a picture from North India, from Punjab, from a city called Amritsar near the uh, Indo-Pakistani border. Uh, and the one on the bottom right is uh, something called the Red Rag Movement in Bogota, in Colombia, in Latin America, where you, if you're hungry, you hang a red rag outside your home so that people, uh, civil society in particular, understands that uh, if it's possible to get some food to you, and it's been very successful in, uh, in uh, mobilizing attention to people's distress. So this is a general problem, I guess, is the point of this. Uh, migrants, of course, are hit especially hard. Um, um, you can find these kinds of headlines pretty much anywhere. Um, in, uh, uh, in Bernie's uh, backyard, you find them in Malaysia. You find them with migrants even in Singapore, uh, where people are finding it difficult, uh, especially difficult to get food. Um, uh, and that's going to be the setting of the uh, particular empirical exercise that we, we conduct in the, uh, in the Indian setting. Um, lots of literature to connect to. I put up two here that I like. Um, one is that uh, when you think about, you do the thought experiment of uh, if you are a, in the risk set for being a migrant, uh, and you're thinking about the act of migrating, uh, and you see a place where you're uh, human capital will be rewarded with much higher wages. Why is it that most people don't move? Uh, uh, one nice answer was by uh, Munshi and Rosenzweig some years ago, where they pointed to a very basic, uh, basic uh, trade-off that rings true to me, which is when you're in your home location, you uh, you can avail of an insurance function provided by your family and uh, local village or kinship networks, whereas uh, uh, and you trade that off. Uh, you trade that desire for security uh, off against uh, the possibility of uh, higher wages somewhere else. 
uh, and it ends up creating a selection mechanism that uh, they find some evidence of, uh, in that case also in the Indian context. The second uh, uh, is uh, to just direct attention to all sorts of uh, um, uh, broad social, social political reasons that are not quote unquote directly economic, whatever that means. Uh, religion being uh, a great example. So this, the, the paper there that I like is from the uh, PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where a uh, very interesting study where they look at second and third generation migrants to southern France, southern Europe. I think it's southern France, if I remember correctly. And they basically show that if you have a Muslim name, uh, Muslim heritage, then uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, your possibility of migrating is reduced quite considerably. Uh, presumably because of uh, some form of discrimination against you. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of reasons why you would think migrants would be hit hard. Uh, and uh, the last uh, bullet there is just to say that migrants uh, of the sort that we're looking at tend to be at the bottom of the income spectrum and so have relatively little, little spare resources to, uh, or physical facilities to be able to store food and are particularly vulnerable to food. So of course, every country has uh, to do something like food security. Uh, you see this in the rich countries, the US and Canada, food banks. Um, I live in a city called Newton, uh, very close to Harvard and MIT. It's one of the most affluent cities in the US. And uh, we have, uh, we've been organizing food drives even in our very affluent city because people find that uh, they cannot find enough, to, cannot find food even for, uh, for a single day. Uh, so this is an endemic problem. Um, India, in the Indian context, uh, there is a, a, a public distribution of food system, which is what I will be alluding to quite a bit in the rest of this uh, brief talk, set up way back in 1944, even before uh, India acquired independence from the British. And of course, there's a very dense network of local charities and NGOs and so on. Uh, and there is a, a, a Food Security Act that was passed in 2013, which uh, makes it uh, uh, the uh, responsibility, legal responsibility of the central government and the governments of the individual states. Uh, uh, in other countries, you might call them provinces, in India we call them states. Uh, so it's a joint responsibility of the center and the state to ensure that food is delivered to every citizen uh, in the uh, country. Um, so the research question here is how do food security policies affect migrants' mobility during the COVID-19 crisis? And of course, the, the, the subtext here is uh, um, that uh, most countries have been in lockdown. India has had perhaps the most uh, sort of Wuhan-like uh, attempt to lock things down nationwide, which is obviously much more complex than doing it in a city or a province, um, um, that has caused incredible distress uh, for all the predictable reasons. Uh, and the tension that we're trying to get at here is if you're a poor person and don't have any food and you're told that you can't go anywhere, um, uh, what do you do if your livelihood is cut out? And well, I think you break the lockdown and you, for, you, know, you start moving. Uh, and that's, that's the tension that we're going to be looking at, which is if arrangements are made by the state and civil society to provide for food to vulnerable people, does it prevent them from moving? Does it allow the lockdown to uh, uh, to be to to have more have greater efficacy? Uh, and our basic answer is, for the most part, yes. If you if you have policies in place to allow migrants who are particularly vulnerable uh, because they're away from their uh, home insurance networks, uh, family and kinship networks, they're particularly vulnerable if you provide for them to get access to food during the lockdown, then they will respect the lockdown. And if you don't, uh, they will move. And those estimates are pretty sizable. Um, so the policy implication I suppose here is that um, uh, pretty obvious that the state, and the state needs to do something to, uh, to address this. Uh, there's another uh, sort of correlation that we draw attention to, which is civil society appears to be a lot more effective in compensating for the state's inadequacies in providing these foods. Uh, and police action, at least in this particular context in India, uh, and there have been lots of reports of uh, 
I wouldn't call it police brutality, but police heavy handedness in, in enforcing lockdowns. Uh, and that has not worked, uh, at least in the data. Um, so what works is kind of the good stuff, which is civil society getting around and providing the food. Uh, so that's kind of a, a preview of what we're trying to do and get to. And uh, I'll step you through the methods and uh, point out uh, in particular the limitations of the analysis. Um, I'm just curious about one thing. This is really aside from research. We have yeah. seen some videos about some policemen using stick to beat up yeah. Was that true or is it just... Yes, yes, it's true. It's true, it's true. It's very true. Uh, those are not fake videos, they're true videos. Um, so this is the kind of thing you're talking about right now? About the yeah, so that's... that's uh, uh, I can't hear, I think it's Bernie, but Bernie, I... Um, yeah, that's the... That's me, yeah. That's the reason uh, why we were... You know, I expected to see that uh, police heavy-handedness uh, would, be, would be effective in controlling lockdowns and uh, we don't find any evidence of that. Um, and there are lots of limitations in that analysis I'll, I'll show you because the measure of police heavy handedness is, uh, is, uh, is pretty second order, but still we don't, you know, there's a lot of noise in that measure. So it's, it's, uh, it's not clear that, uh, you know, the, the, that, that I would put too much stock in that result, but for whatever it's worth, the, uh, the same measurement error pertains to, applies to civil society and there the effect is pretty robust. So, uh, I'll... Uh, Jigo, you want to ask any other questions? Should I keep going? Uh, can I ask you a question? So, uh, how do you access the uh, PDS shops? Do, do you access them in, in your home locality or, or, or can you access them uh, in, in your place of work if you happen to be a migrant? Yeah, yeah, that's the whole point of the exercise, which is that in some, uh, in some, in some states, you're allowed to access them away. So uh, for those of you who are, you know, uh, uh, obviously there are lots of people here from Asia, lots of people familiar with China. Uh, the, there's some, there's, what I'm going to talk about is the ration card, which is a piece of paper yeah. that allows you access to subsidized food. And that's like the Chinese hukou. So traditionally, you could only use it in your, uh, which is your question. Uh, who is that, Chantai? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so uh, yeah, so, so Chantai, that, that, that traditionally allowed you food only in your you know, home village or home city, your home location. And some of the states have, uh, in a policy exercise going back several years, and this is really the whole, the content of the whole paper, is some of the, uh, some of the states have allowed you to begin using that outside of your home location. Uh, so, in effect, in those cases, there has been a pre-existing policy intervention uh, to allow uh, migrants access to food, even if they're away from home. And so they don't, they don't, they don't move around too much. That's really the excess. So I'll say a little bit more about that. If you just give me a second. Tyrone, yeah, uh, since you're on this point, you know, something yeah. that may be important is that why some states allow food to redeem in their location, in some states, no. I mean, why there's some mobility in some and less in other? Yeah, it, I mean, this is a, a, obviously a central central issue in interpreting the correlation, Bernie. Um, uh, short answer is I don't fully know. I've been trying to go into the political economy of uh, whether this is driven by uh, anything that should affect our analysis. So far, we've not been able to find anything. So the best we're able to do is do some, uh, uh, you know, Gary King was my colleague, uh, in the statistics department here, government statistics department, uh, has developed all these matching techniques uh, to try to control for these sorts of things. So I'll share some of those. But the short answer is, uh, I don't know um, exactly what drives. And in fact, there are variations uh, of um, uh, portability of the ration card within a state, right? Um, so in other words, if you're a migrant from uh, one one city in a state to another city in the same state, right? Uh, you could that that your ration card could be respected in other locations in your home state, but it may not be respected in another state. Um, and then there's a cluster of states in India that have um, uh, allowed for interstate respecting of each other's ration cards. In other words, going back to the hukou analogy, for those of you who find that uh, more useful or, or illustrative, um, you know, if you were in, uh, 
uh, if you you know if your hukou is only respected in your home province uh, in Henan or Zhejiang or something like that, then that's one thing. But if you could go to Jiangsu or some other place, then uh, that makes it more migration more feasible. Um, so burning short answers, I don't know, but uh, let let me let me move on. Let's say what I do know uh, about it. There is some temporal variation that's interesting. So it might afford us some uh, some interpretive interpretive purchase. Um, can I ask you just one more question? So if if you moved to somewhere else, um, yeah. what happens to your to to your food card? Does your family back home use it? Um, that is, do you have to be physically present, or can, can you just uh, show up? And, and then the question is, what do they do with it? Uh, uh, with it, uh, if they use your food card, uh, what do they do with that food? Maybe they consume it, maybe they sell it, although they're not supposed to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so, so several things. Uh, um, one is the, one contextual thing to note. Several contextual things, uh, uh, really quickly. One is that. Uh, the family ration cards are linked, and there are some family limits on the food. Um, there's also limitations on how much you can, as a family member, take out on the basis of your ration card, right? So, for instance, you cannot withdraw more than half of the food at any point in time uh, of your allocation for a particular, let's say, a month. I don't know exactly what the time duration is, but let's say it's a month. And what that does is it prevents, let's say, the male migrant from taking all the food and he's away somewhere and then leaving others stranded. Um, so there are those restrictions. Uh, the second thing is that, I mean, there are about 500,000 ration shop locations around the country. Um, about 80, about 90% of them are uh, electronically linked. Uh, so they have electronic point of sale uh, kind of uh, uh, architecture, uh, computer architecture. So. And this has all happened in the last, uh, I would say, less than decade. And so the amount of fraud that used to be there in the system has declined dramatically. Um, and the, the important thing to note is about the stuff that's being handed out in the ration shops is that uh, it is heavily subsidized. Um, I want to say that it's almost food grains at 10% of market price. So historically, what you would see is uh, a lot of illegal activity of picking exactly the sort that you would imagine, which is the free market kicking in in all sorts of ways, that people would, uh, so I grew up in India as a child, and it was quite common to see people abusing the system, where you would go procure this at a 90% discount and resell it in the open market, or you would, you know, beat up somebody else who was vulnerable and take their ration cards and use it to go grab stuff. Um, so th that's a little bit of contextual stuff, but a lot of that shenanigans have gone away in the last decade because of the, uh, cleaning up of the Indian system quite dramatically. Uh, so, uh, oh, but, but, but the question is whether it is precisely yeah. these shenanigans that might solve this problem in the following sense, that if you have a migrant that doesn't have access because they're somewhere else, you could have the family using his or her food cart at, at home taking their grains, selling it, and then and they're transferring the money to the migrant. I see, uh, I see. Yeah, I don't think that, I, I think the, the incidence of fraud has declined so much that it would be very difficult to do that systemically. That's my sense. Uh, I'll try to look into it some more, but I don't know that I have a better, uh, you know, more concrete answer to it. Uh, that kind of thing would have happened in my childhood for sure. Uh, can, can, all sorts of. Can yeah. I ask you what, just one more question yeah, yeah, uh, ju just sure. about the political economy and the politics yeah. of this? Given yeah. just the hundreds of millions of migrants in, uh, in yeah. India, yeah. why has, the, uh, maybe there is, well, I mean, even before this, uh, the event in the last few years, well, why yeah. hasn't there been a discussion that of making the system integrated nationally? Oh boy, that's such a huge can of worms. Uh, uh, I don't know how to, how to really answer that in this context. Um, uh, you know, versions of uh, uh, that same question could be asked in a continuum of settings, a continuum of policy instruments. There are so many uh, uh, high level failures of the Indian state. Um, um, uh, there's a lack of an integrated market. So, my favorite, uh, favorite. Uh, 
uh, sort of not counterfactual setting, but alternative setting where you could have asked the question is, you know, why has there not been a single market for goods? Just transportation of goods across the country when it would be so obviously beneficial. Uh, and the answer is rent seeking at a variety of levels. Local, local officials have uh, their own areas where they can exercise their, their power. Uh, historically, the uh, public distribution system was uh, a source of a high degree of corruption, a lot of uh, what is euphemistically called leakage of resources. In other words, I don't remember the numbers, but I remember seeing a study before the entire uh, identity system in India leapfrogged the world to become entirely biometric, um, which is very recent uh, and is an experiment I was involved with. Um, before that, you literally had leakages of 60, 70% uh, of the tens of billions of dollars that were poured into food distribution and food subsidies would vanish. And, uh, you know, it's versions of rent seeking at all levels that had prevented the, uh, uh, prevented the uh, harmonization of that. Uh, that's a, a pretty aggregate conceptual answer <laughs> to a very aggregate uh, question. So I don't know that I can do better than that in this, uh, in this particular moment. Uh, Aaron, why don't you just uh, um, just going forward? Should I keep going? See the yeah. <laughs> okay, no problem. These questions are fine because you know it'll allow me to go through the rest of the slides fast. <laughs> um, sorry, this is a bit busy. I've already said most of this in response to Chantai and Bernie. Um, uh, just big picture numbers: there's a billion three people. Um, there's still only uh, 230 million cardholders, and the mapping of cardholders to families is a bit unclear to me. That's something. There's 534,000 shops, uh, digitized, very, very subsidized. Uh, and one important thing to, to understand the importance of food security is that 60% of this, this socioeconomic spectrum uh, of their monthly income is spent on food, right? So, so food is really the driver of uh, uh, household consumption. Uh, forget about savings and all that kind of stuff. Or uh, these are people who have no permanent, uh, permanent address or home of their own. Uh, outside of their uh, origin location. Um, the, the word at the bottom that looks odd to you in English, Aadhaar, is a Hindi word meaning foundation. It's a name given to the national biometric ID. Uh, it really is an extraordinary uh, 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 project. It's leapfrogged literally everybody in the world to, uh, to create an identity system for I think 1.1 1 .1, 1 .1 or 1 1.2 of the 1.3 billion people so that you can be instantly identified with uh, very, very low levels of fraud at this point, uh, almost non-existent fraud. Uh, but that's what you do to receive your, uh, your ration. Um, you can see on the left, the old ration card, which is a physical piece of paper. Um, and the picture in the middle uh, is, uh, is somebody using their biometrics to receive their uh, ration ID. Um, uh, so I've already said most of this. Historically, one could only use ration card in the home ration shop. And the policy experiment that's happened in recent times is that, that those local restrictions have been relaxed in two different ways that I now articulate. The first has to do with this idea of intrastate portability, right? which is you can use the ration card in any shop in the home state. Uh, for context, there's about 30-odd uh, you know, states in India. Um, of those starting in about 2015, uh, and the timing is important, 13 states have, have fully implemented the intrastate portability uh, policy. Uh, five states just began to adopt it, and so I would describe them as uh, partially having implemented the, the, the policy. Um, and it's, it's interesting to, and I don't know the details of this, I'm just making a note to myself, what does implementing mean? Uh, I think it means rationalizing somehow the point of sale system, uh, educating the, uh, uh, the local uh, ration shop uh, person who's distributing the grains that they need to now respect uh, this kind of portability, uh, a compliance function, a governance function, a whole host of uh, micro interventions uh, that probably take time to pull off, I'm guessing, because I'm going to, I'm going to rely on that to interpret some of the correlation. Um, so this is the first kind of portability within the state, right? So I just put up one of the states, the southern state of Kerala, two, uh, you know, two districts within it. So it would allow somebody from 
Kotayam on the left to have their ration card respected in cozy code on the right. The other is in, interstate portability, uh, same idea, which is if you're a migrant from one state to another state, um, in one of these 12 states uh, that have allowed for interstate portability, then you can use your ration card anywhere. And it turns out that all these interstate portability states, unsurprisingly, already have intrastate portability uh, embedded within it. For context, uh, good to note that 88% uh, of India's internal migrants are intrastate. So most people are moving from uh, a city uh, or a village to another city or village in the same kind of state or province. And 12% are interstate. Uh, so we're just going to look at two sets of... Uh, One clarification. Yeah, sure. Uh, just simple clarification. Um, is there any case that you have interstate portability but no intrastate portability? No. So once you have inter, it means that there's already automatically intra. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, Thank that, you. I mean, it's, uh, yes, buddy, the, the answer is yes, that's correct. Um, and if you think, you know, just, just practically speaking, uh, the negotiation of interstate portability requires dealing with a different uh, government apparatus, which is going to be far more transaction intensive than dealing with your own bureaucracy within your state. So it's likely that you would first do it within your state. Uh, and then uh, there's also, you know, to, you know, Chanta, you didn't ask this, but I imagine you could ask this uh, about the political economy, uh, about the financial flows that are really interesting. Uh, because what happens is that part of the each state's budget, and I, I don't know the full details of this, but part of each state's budget uh, is uh, coming out of uh, 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 direct taxation at the state level as well as indirect taxation at the state level. And a large part of the budget um, is coming from transfers from the center, from the federal government, so to speak. Uh, and generally, the federal government is running uh, running a redistributive mechanism from the richest states to the poorest states, uh, as you would as you would expect. Um, so, in uh, and uh, part of the answer to Bernie's question uh, is going to lie in understanding it, part of the answer to the question of why these twelve states have done interstate portability uh, has to lie in answering uh, what's the political economy of the fiscal transfers from the center to the states. Okay. So that's what I'm trying to unpack uh, in this exercise, uh, but we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, uh, Bernie, does that make sense? Uh, that's why I couldn't answer the question of why, because I think it's connected to the financial flows, which in turn is gonna be connected to, uh, because India is a democracy, it's gonna be connected to which parties in power at each state, and which parties in power at the center, and those uh, jockeying for uh, 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 coalitional uh, arrangements, so to speak. Uh, okay, good to go. Please. So we're just going to look at two kind of different diff, uh, correlations, one having to do with interstate portability and separately an interstate portability. You can just keep them separate. Uh, and the, 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 the punchline is that the interstate portability of the ration card, in other words, allowing the ration card to be used anywhere in the state, is very effective in uh, enforcing the lockdown. Um, so if you can get food anywhere in your state, you're less likely to run around looking for it, very intuitively. Uh, but empirically, it seems to work. Um, now, remember that these uh, policies were adopted, you know, five years ago or two years ago, not in response to, to COVID uh, uh, or anything currently. Uh, and the interstate portability, which is a much more recent thing, does not appear to be effective at all. Uh, and that probably is simply because not enough time has elapsed uh, yet for those mechanisms to have been put in place. That's, that's a hunch. That's an interpretation of uh, And then separately, we'll just look at local activism by, as I was alluding to, the police, the heavy-handedness of the police, as well as the ration shops and civil society actors and so on, to see whether they curb uh, intra and interstate Okay. Um, uh, Tarun, can I ask you a question? So I... Yeah. I I have this impression, uh, just, just, uh, and this is just a casual impression, that there, is a, there are a significant number of migrants that live at their place of work. Um, so, so then when work, so when, uh, so when the quarantine hits, 
um, they not only lose their jobs, but they also lose their home, essentially. Um, so then what do you do if you're getting food from the ration card, uh, from the ration card, which is mostly my impression is that it's, it's mostly rice and wheat, right? Mm -hmm. What do you do with it if, if you don't have a place to cook? Um, it's a great question. I'm trying to actually relate it to, uh, not to the paper, but to what I know, what's unfolding in, uh, in places like Mumbai and Delhi, because the, the issue that you mentioned is, uh, um, is like a daily issue, because a lot of these people are living in, uh, uh, in like small rooms on the sides of factory floors, uh, or they're living, uh, if they're, you know, like a security guard in a hotel, uh, they'd be living in the back of the hotel um, and cooking on cook stoves, uh, which are powered by um, some kind of dirty fuel uh, on the roadside. So they would just continue to do that on the roadside, or they would, uh, uh, if they were denied their their occupation um, and lose their income and and therefore their place of dwelling, they would scurry around and look for others uh, to give them charity. Um, uh, as an example, in my own family home in Delhi, uh, which is a large space, uh, we have a lot of people who are just given shelter. Um, so basically charity of different shorts will kick in Shantai, as best as I can tell. Uh, but I don't have any non-anecdotal uh, information on that. But you're absolutely right that the... Um, that the uh, place of dwelling is often connected to the um, connected to uh, the place of work, uh, so to speak. Right, uh, but just just a, a, a quick follow up. If uh, I cannot cook, can I just sell the food, get cash, and then buy uh, cooked food? You could. It would be illegal. Uh, you you could, and in practice, I think it would actually be quite difficult to. Um, Actually, I don't know why it would be difficult. It, not necessarily to be difficult. I was just trying to put myself in. in uh, I, I, I fell. I, I fell into the trap of saying, "What would I do?" <laughs> and I, the truth is that if I had a bag of rice, I wouldn't know what to do with it or uh, to go sell it in the market. But I'm sure if you're a very poor person and you're desperate, you would find somebody to to arbitrage of that. That's correct. But, but here's a way in which you could try to do something, because my impression is that the local yeah. activism has been mostly about providing cooked food, about uh, cooked food. That's so, then, uh, so, so then, and then maybe for the, 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 for the people that also lose a place to cook, that kind of activism is going to be a lot more, is, is a lot more effective than making the food shops available to them. Yeah, that's uh, that's fair. I mean, I actually expected the activism to be more effective, Chiang Thai, than than the portability of the ration cards. Uh, but that's not the case here. We find that the portability actually has a has, has a huge effect, at least in this this localized, uh, this limited empirical exercise. Uh, but I agree with you, um, particularly. Uh, you know, there are lots of communities in India, including the one that I originate from in the Punjab where it is a tradition to provide free food. Uh, so a lot of us in our, at least growing up in India, you would go, it's like the soup kitchens in America, right? Uh, that we would go every weekend to the local temple and uh, the task of the well-off was to cook for the community uh, and to provide the resources and then to the physical labor. So the importance is in the labor uh, and to make the food and then to serve it to the poorest people. Right, so that's a tradition um, in, in many parts of India. And what you're finding is that that is of course gonna kick in um, with people doing it in space. In fact, when we have in this country, like the state of New York, uh, a very interesting factoid. If you look at the last couple of crises when people have, because of you know, hurricanes or cyclones, um, you know, we will have all the FEMA related disasters in this country. Uh, uh, a lot of the most effective food provision is by these same Indian communities, by the Sikh communities who gather together and you know, drive around the U.S. providing free food to anybody who's out of food. And it comes from that tradition. But you're right, it's cooked food. It's basic cooked food. And it's, uh, it's essentially rice, wheat, uh, and some form of uh, uh, protein in the form of legumes, right? Like uh, peas and uh, uh, 
things of that nature that have protein and carbohydrates in it. Uh, so in, in effect, it is a full meal uh, uh, made very, uh, very, very quickly. Okay. Um, so data, uh, big picture numbers just helps uh, historic migration patterns. About a third of India's population would uh, self-characterize themselves as migrants. In other words, what they count as their home location at that point is different from where they are, where they are working. Um, the, uh, most of these, 88% of them are, uh, are intrastate migrants. 12% are interstate migrants. That's good to, good to keep in mind. And I think this little table essentially gives all the results. We don't really need to go into all the sophisticated stuff. This is essentially tells you the story. That if you look at pre-lockdown and post-lockdown, I'll define pre and post in a second. Uh, there's some limitations associated with that also. Um, but you look at the first two rows, you see uh, the intrastate movement in states with full intrastate portability uh, compared with less than full, you see that the decline in mobility is much greater when you have ration cards portable. 52% uh, is a bigger decline than 39%. Um, and the bottom two rows is about interstate portability. And there, you know, the 33% is not a greater decline than 37%. Uh, in fact, it goes the other way. Um, so I'll just say that again for clarity because the words sometimes are uh, uh, com more complicated than necessary. Uh, the first two rows say that if you are uh, in a state that has, that has allowed for this uh, ration card portability, then you see a much bigger decline uh, in mobility due to the lockdown right? uh, than if you were in a state that didn't allow the portability. And that summary stat is really what holds up uh, in uh, quite robustly in different estimations. Um, can, 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 can I ask you a question about how you want us to think about the pre-lockdown numbers? So the, the, so yeah. the, say the intrastate movement of people per day. So you want us to think about the visa as just being steady state flows? And yes, that's right. That's right. And, and we, we, you know, it's not so much in the paper, but uh, the, the source of these data, as I'll say in a second, is Facebook, uh, Facebook Data for Good uh, uh, program, uh, which reports uh, anonymized aggregates uh, of the sort that I'll describe. Uh, but you can do better analyses uh, that say, okay, you know, if the data on a particular day that we're looking at, say 207 people are moving, um, uh, per day from a location, uh, you can compare to those, you know, the seven prior Wednesdays or the Wednesday in prior years or something like that. And uh, it, you know, first approximation, yes, that's uh, that's how I would think about it. How do you? But but suppose that all that's going on here is just that, as a consequence of the lockdown, you, you see just. Uh, the number of people going from the villages to the city is is going down um is going down and and how do you know that that's that it's not that that that's uh, that is accounted for because i uh, as opposed to i i i i guess i'm having a hard time wrapping my head around yeah to thinking about you know the steady state flows what happens to the steady state flows versus the effect of the lockdown itself on on, because you are moving from one steady state to another one. Um, yeah, but these are, but just hold on till I, till, I, till I show you the timing of this. This is, A, the announcement of the lockdown is super sudden, right? Um, and you're just looking at a few days right before and right after. So I don't know that we're talking about um, any grand adjustment period. Uh, so I'm I'm missing the I'm missing the point of the question. Uh, okay, so try, try me again if you want. Yeah. So the question is okay. So suppose that pre-lockdown there are these mm -hmm. uh, the, there, there are these flows that happen in the steady state. There are people yeah. that move from the village to the city, and there are people that yeah. move back from the city to to that that move back from the city to to the uh, uh, village. Now. Mm -hmm. 
the lockdown happens, right? The lo lockdown happens. So, so then, the, so there, there are two questions. How, what happens to these two two types of steady state flows? That's 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 the for first thing. And then the second thing is that you also have a stock of people that, that are in the cities. Uh, so the, the, there's also a stock that wasn't moving in the steady state. So then something is going to happen to that stock. Um, so I, I guess that the, the part that I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around is, is the, the lockdown, it's affecting the steady state, whatever the forces are behind this, the, the flows, the steady state flows mm -hmm. versus it's changing the stock. Uh, uh, I see. Um, so I, you know, I, okay, so I understand what you're saying. Uh, I, I think that empirically, uh, um, this is a second order concern or a third order concern, Chantai. I mean, the stock is so large relative to the flows um, in, these, uh, in these locations, at least to the flows in, in a few days that I don't know that it's productive to think about uh, changes in the stock uh, in any meaningful sense. Uh, but that's just my, my hunch. Some, I, I'll think some more about it, but I, I don't know that. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me move ahead and show you what we're doing. Um, I have a quick question. Because I think it may, it may speak to this, and otherwise you can bring it up again. I'm sorry, there's another comment? Uh, yes, this is Bernie. May I ask yeah. another? Yeah. yeah. The, <clears throat> why is the second row so much less than the first row, and this, and then the pattern is reversed in the third and the fourth? Okay. So the first two rows are about one, if you will, policy treatment, which is interesting. Yeah, one is accordingly. full and, and partial. The other one is uh, is uh, full and without interstate. Yeah, yeah. So I, you so know, actually just so there it is a reverse in the gap. So I, do, I, I am just puzzled what it means. Uh, no. So I mean, you know, if the second row had been uh, no interest rate, then we would have gotten an even bigger effect. So that's how we should have presented it. Uh, does that does that help? So the first two rows are um, about comparing full mobility within the state versus not full mobility. Think of it I, that I, what I what I What I have in mind is that the first two rows are all about interstate portability. Yes. And yes. then you full portability with a lot higher number of stock of flow traffic, okay? Then in the third and the fourth, uh, you have with full interstate portability with no interstate portability. So you would expect that the, if the, the portability is related to the mobility or something like that, then you expect that, that one to be bigger than, if one is bigger than two, then three should be bigger than four. Yes, but you don't see that. Yeah, uh, that's my question. No, no, no. So that's, that's the whole exercise. Is what we're trying to say is that, um, that the second policy instrument here, which is interstate, portability, which should also reduce migration, uh, should result in greater efficacy of the lockdown. Uh, we don't see that happen. And uh, the, you know, the 33 and 37, it's actually even of the wrong sign. Um, uh, if you did a comparison of distributions, you would see that the distributions are indistinguishable from each other. So in other words, the, the, the interstate portability, uh, one interpretation is that it's just not had any effect as yet because it's a much more recent, recent phenomenon, uh, which is what I think is actually what's going on. But um, that's only a conjecture as to why you have that. Uh, so, so I agree with you that you would have expected that the, the comparing the third and fourth rows that what is showing us 33% reduction, 37% reduction, uh, you would expect the, re the reverse of relative ordering, right? Um, and a significant difference, but you don't see that. Um, quick word on the data. This is a very skewed sample, something to keep in mind. Um, these, are, th these are data from Facebook, uh, 
So therefore, Facebook reaches only, um, uh, how many people does Facebook reach? Uh, Facebook reaches about 300 million people in India. Right? 300 million people access Facebook on phones. This data feed is from 30 million users. Uh, and in particular, it's from those who um, turn on their location services, right? So if you think about it, this is not the uh, entire population of migrants. In fact, it's not even the poorest migrants where you would expect uh, food security issues to be most biting. These are relatively better off migrants who have a smartphone, uh, have Facebook, uh, and have familiarity with the smartphone to turn on location services. So for those of you who have been to India or a poor country like India, you see a lot of poor people on the street uh, with absolutely nothing. This is not them. This is people who actually have a, a, a job, a basic job, most likely very poor, low-end job, uh, and are carrying a smartphone, which these days more and more people have, of course, uh, but also have the, the, the savvy to know to turn on the location service or not turn it on and so on. Um, but we think that if anything, food, food insecurity should not, should be less likely to affect these people's mobility decisions than the poorest people who we are most concerned with. So it should bias us against finding a correlation, we think. Uh, but wait, it's important wait, to wait. But yeah. so so it, it seems that what you're saying is is that very few people in the sample is going to be accessing the PDA shops. No, no, no. The PDA shops, I would say, a lot of people access. I would say, you know, forty percent of the population, fifty percent, sixty percent access PDA shops. I so see. what I'm saying is that this is not like Chantai, This is not the like the bottom ten percent of the population. This is probably my hunches. <laughs> this is like you know, the, the two deciles above that, maybe. That's a hunch, <laughs> I don't know, right? Um, but PDS shops, you know, even, even, you know, reasonably well-off middle-class families will, will use the PDS shop. You know, uh, why would you not? It's like free food that people can hand out in the middle of, uh, uh, even, in, uh, even in the richest cities. Okay. Um, so everybody, would uh, every as far as I know, even middle upper middle class families would, would go use the PDS shop. Uh, it's just part of part of life. So, okay. So on the left is a state Gujarat that has uh, uh, full portability, and you see the movement reduction is quite large. It's just illustrative. Move from one sub district to another sub district of that state, um, and on the right you have a different state Orisha. Uh, and you see less movement reduction. So that's the idea. Um, um, and the movement is measured by an aggregate of number of people traveling from a sub-district to a sub-district. So just some, again, some numerical context. 30-odd uh, states in the country, um, you know, uh, 700 districts in the country. So think about 20, 25 districts per state. Um, and about 150 sub-districts per state. Right? So what we're doing is it's at the sub-district level. So you got the whole country, then you got states, you got districts, you got sub-districts. So we're at the sub-district level. Uh, and to calibrate, uh, you know, Ahmedabad in the left picture there uh, is a, you know, a city of, I would say, that you don't know how many people live there. If I had to guess, I would say it's a, city of about 5 million people, 6 million people, right? So a uh, mid-sized city. Um, so um, okay, can I ask my question again? So the, in, in terms of the flows, uh, the normal flows, yeah. um, how do you know whether the flows that you saw on March 19, like what fraction of them were, say, uh, truck drivers for which going from Ahmedabad to, to, to Sanan was just part of their normal work versus that these were migrants who had migrated from Sanan to Ahmedabad and they were going back home to take care of a sick child or something uh, or something um, because it matters what 
the, uh, you know, what, uh, be, because you would have, the mechanism that you have in mind is going to affect the second group, but it's not going to affect the first group. Yeah, I, 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 understand, I understand what you're saying. I don't know. Uh, all, I, all I observe is the aggregates. So I don't know uh, what is in the aggregates. That, 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 that is a correct critique. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this. So here, here's the here's the sample, right? Um, so this is another another limitation, if you will. The, the, the pre, there's a pre and a post period. So what we have are data from March 19 to 21, which is before the draconian lockdown was announced, and the lockdown went into effect in you know a few hours, essentially. Um, as a side note, it was extremely poorly done. Um, and uh, something that I've also complained about to the to the government and the prime minister's office directly, uh, not not just me, hundreds of people have complained about it. Um, just very poorly done. Um, why I can't speculate. Uh, and uh, then we exclude the next couple of days when there was a lot of turmoil from a me from a measurement perspective, and then we the post period we we we. We characterize this March 25th to April 3rd. Um, uh, and so we've got a pre and a post. The pre is, I would have liked it to be longer than three days, but that's what we have because the Facebook data were not available prior to that for reasons I don't know. Um, so we're left with about 200,000 sub-district to sub-district uh, dyad day observations. Right? So we're looking at pairs of subdistricts uh, by day. Um, so that those those are the data. Uh, and to Chantai's question, I don't know. Uh, I just know the aggregates of people doing that movement, uh, but I don't know what's in that. The best that we can do is maybe compare that to uh, corresponding days uh, much before and try to get some inference, but even then I don't think you'd get a satisfactory answer to whether it's the truck driver regularly moving or it's someone moving to find food for a sick child. Um, I have five minutes. Uh, was that correct? I have five minutes? Yes. Oh, I have a six minutes, seven minutes. So very, 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 it's very simple actually. So five minutes is just fine. Um, the questions have been great. Thank you very much. Uh, but here's the uh, first uh, set of correlations, uh, which is, um, so here, oh, sorry. Uh, actually, uh, let's just look at the picture. The picture basically says that states that adopted the policy, the policy of intrastate portability, right? So we've marked them in stripes. Hopefully you can see the stripes, right? So they're striped and solid in that picture. And uh, the legend on the right shows the percentage change in intrastate movement, with darker uh, being more reduction in movement. And you see that there's a correlation between um, those states that adopted intrastate portability of this ration card slash um, uh, and reduction in, in mobility. Uh, and in fact, you can, you can, in the estimation, you can see a gradation, which is that there's more reduction in mobility for full portability, uh, less reduction for partial portability, and the least reduction for um, no portability. So that's, that's the direction that we would effect, expect it to go to the extent that, it's, and it's just worth, worth reiterating that uh, for somebody in the lower spectrum of uh, lower income spectrum, food is a driver of expenditure, right? and of course survival. And so, uh, how do I read the portability here? Portability. Sorry? How do I read the portability in this figure? How do you read the portability? So the, uh, I, the, I only see the the movement reduction. On no, the so color. the stripe, the stripes. Can you see the stripes? stripes. I, I yeah. can see it now. Okay, okay. Yeah. the striped states are the portability and uh, the full portability and the non-striped states are the- Got it. Less than full portability, okay? So you basically, as you go, you basically see that the 
the stripe states are darker. Yes. Got are darker. That's, that's the point. That's all. Mm -hmm. the same, same idea here. You know, the one on the left is called volatility. It's darker than the one on the right, which is not volatility. Different states. You're seeing it at the same level. Okay. Um, and the, the, the interstate, you don't see that, essentially. Uh, same correlation. Uh, I'm trying to show you the same picture. There's no... Um, the states that have interstate portability uh, are, again, the striped ones. They're not noticeably darker than the other, the other uh, states that haven't done interstate portability. So that's really the content of the, uh, the, the different width correlations. Uh, on activism, um, uh, if we had time, we'd go into measurement, uh, but we don't. And the measures are really quite imperfect, actually. They're based on looking for uh, Looking for um, uh, looking for keywords in Factiva. Uh, huge limitation here is you're you're using the English language press. So, to be, so let me put it this way: um, going back to Bernie's question about uh, you know police beating people up, uh, it's much likelier it seems to me that you would see reports of police beating people up in the non-English media, in the in the uh, local language media. Um, uh, you know, I used to be the uh, main director, one of the main directors on India's biggest microfinance firm uh, for 10 years, 15 years. And we, we, we operated at every tiny village distributing uh, money in a, in a, in a for-profit model. And so you had to come face to face with uh, uh, goons and uh, thugs and uh, things of that nature. So, and I know that all that stuff actually shows up in the, in the local media, not in the English media. So that's a huge limitation here. But for whatever it's worth, with that very noisy measure, you can still see that kind of the good things done by charities and ration shop activism. Uh, this is ration shop activism, not so much the legislation of what a ration shop is allowed to do. Um, that does reduce mobility, not as much as the policy instrument of full portability, but still significant. Whereas the police uh, shenanigans don't seem to make much difference. Um, so then we got a whole set of analyses on, because going back to Bernie's critique, which I'm very concerned about, uh, which is why do some states adopt portability and some states don't, right? Uh, because it could just be that you're picking up something else completely. Uh, so here we borrow from, you know, Gary King's uh, uh, econometrics, where he has developed this what's called a course of exact matching. But essentially, it's a different way of saying that you take each sub-district, which is the level at which we want to do, look at the analysis, so sub-district to sub-district movement, uh, and you try to match it on a variety of dimensions that would seem to be relevant with other sub-districts that are roughly similar, that are not treated, in other words, are not, are not portable. Um, and the good news is that uh, we get very high degree of match with our unmatched types of analyses. Uh, so instead of a 12% reduction in mobility for full portability, you get something like a 14, 15% reduction. Um, so- um, Tyron, yeah. can, can I make one suggestion of something that maybe yes. you could show at the very beginning? Um, I, I believe that, um, so you could use the data from the National Sample Survey, which has detailed data on, on, on how much the family is getting from the PDS shops. And I believe they also have information on whether their family is a migrant or, or not. So one of the things that we used to show at the very beginning is the extent to which the policy that you are looking at actually does work in terms of allowing migrant families or, or uh, to get access to subsidized food. Um, yes, that's a good point. Uh, and in fact, we have we have done a version of that, Chantai, not not going to the national si national sample survey, but going to reports from the survey, and that's exactly what it shows. Uh, okay. But 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 thank you. Yes, we can do a better job. It's a, it's a, it's a fair and a very good point. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm out of time, but really, that's the the the. Uh, I guess what I would say in summary is that what we're looking at here is a I think an important problem in poor countries and in rich countries is food insecurity. Uh, and the idea that if you are asked by the, uh, the political economy structures in your location to lock down, 
and you are somebody who doesn't have the luxury of access to indefinite food supplies, uh, you're going to do something to feed yourself. Uh, and the question is, what else can be done by the state to allow, what other you know, complementary treatments are needed uh, to allow the lockdown treatment to be, in a, to be effective? Uh, and what we're showing is that uh, portability of access to subsidized food in a poor country actually does have a very large first order effect in reducing mobility or in enforcing the lockdown. Uh, of course, this is independent of whether you think the lockdown is a good idea or not. This is just conditional on the idea that you want it to, to work in the first instance. Um, and that, uh, and that uh, civil society activism also plays a smaller but measurably important role uh, in, uh, in, in making the lockdown work. And that uh, most likely uh, authoritarian shenanigans uh, by the power structure, at least in one democracy, uh, fail. Uh, so uh, that's Thanks. that's kind of the content of the paper. Uh, thank you so Thanks much for so the uh, very engaging yes. conversation. I appreciate it. Yes, yes, I uh, learned uh, quite a bit. So uh, <laughs> before before we uh, we uh, 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 move on to the next. Uh, so uh, next week we will have some uh, some some some. Uh, um, a group that are studying the early payment data on China's recovery. So that will be an exciting project that I'm uh, uh, not me we're working on, but I know some friend or uh, they can get access to it. And I hope that uh, you know uh, that discussion will be more uh, in it, um, kind of get to the heart of the recovery. And then now we so far been focusing on the lockdown side, and I think it's time to move on to a little bit to see the recovery. Um, and uh, we will, uh, I, I would like to get some people to actually have uh, some uh, um, follow up discussion with Toronto. I, said, I am very interested in that. But uh, by the way, that uh, we, you know, you're, you're free to go. This is just a hangout time. And thanks for coming and I am looking forward to meet you uh, in the next week.